Well, good evening. Um, If you're here, it's probably not a surprise to you that we're making our way through the book of the Bible, and tonight we are in the the book of Numbers. So if you'll turn, open your Bibles to the book of Numbers. And as we read tonight, um, I would, my recommendation would be is that you would follow along in the book of Numbers. Occasionally I will go and look at other books of the Bible, but it'll probably be easiest for you to Um, Stay current just by staying put in Numbers, and I'll read the other passages out loud. But as we look at the book of Numbers, let's recall where we've been before. Uh, In Genesis, God promises Abraham descendants, a relationship, and land. In Exodus, God multiplied the descendants of Abraham and formalized his relationship with them at Sinai, which included his covenant and his presence with them. In Leviticus, Yahweh gives them a structured and regulated set of sacrifices and feasts for having their sins covered and for worshiping him at the tabernacle. And Leviticus also provides detailed instruction of God's holiness and their own need for holiness. From a timeline perspective, Numbers continues where the Exodus Uh, where Exodus left off, with Yahweh dwelling in the newly constructed tabernacle. Israel will soon leave Sinai and begin its journey in anticipation of fulfillment of the next promise, the land promise. But within six months, the Exodus generation forfeits the promised land and will spend the next 39 years awaiting their death so that a new generation can enter the land. Will they be like the first generation? What special instructions do they need as they prepare to enter the land? In part, they need the book of Numbers. So that brings us to the purpose of the book of Numbers. It should be on the screen. There we go. Um, Numbers prepared the second generation of Israel for entering the promised land by instructing them about traveling to and living in the land, reminding them of God's faithfulness to his promises, warning them of the devastation of cultivating sinful desires, and exhorting them to place their faith in Yahweh alone. A short note about the structure of the book. Numbers is really structured around the two censuses of the armies of Israel. Clearly, fulfillment was going to involve battle. The first census, taken in the second year after the Exodus, is found in chapter 1. And then the second census is found in chapter 26, which is in the 40th year after the Exodus. So you'll see the structure. Um, That structure is kind of reflected in our outline tonight. And so we'll look at the first part of the outline. The first division will follow the first census in chapter one. And it deals with the first generation that came out of Egypt. And that covers chapters one through 25, the first generation. The first 10 chapters prepare Israel for the promised land. And then there's a clear transition between chapters 10 and 11 when Israel actually departs Sinai. And they move the tabernacle for the first time, and and then we get to see Israel's rebellion in the wilderness. In chapter 22, they arrive at Moab, where they will be for really till the book of Joshua. And we see the final rebellion of the first generation in the beginning of the 40th year on the plains of Moab. The first generation passes away, and in chapter 26, we have the second census, census of the second generation. And those were, it's the generation of those that were not born or they were too young to fight 39 years earlier. And this will cover chapters 26 through 36. Uh, Through chapter 32, we see renewed instruction on offerings and festivals. There's the settlement of the Transjordan, that land east of the Jordan. Uh, There's also some unfinished business with Midian. Um, And then the section closes with a summary of the 39 39 years uh, of wandering that remain. The final section of the book begins at the end of chapter 33 and continues to the end, and it primarily deals with instructions concerning the land that they are about to enter. 
And a couple things to note as you're reading the book of Numbers on your own is that these various sections of the book are not equal in their length or in their pacing. Um, Numbers numbers covers about 39 years of the 40-year period between the Exodus and the conquest. And the first year of that period has already taken place in the books of Exodus and Leviticus. And so Numbers is going to concern itself with the remaining 39 years. Um, So in in the book of Numbers, you will find that chapters 1 through 14 are going to cover just the first six months after the book of Exodus. After the tabernacle is stood up, the first 14 chapters will cover the first six months. And then going to the end of the book, the last 17 chapters from chapters 20 to 36 are going to spend time in the, just the 40th year. Uh, so we got the first six months occurring in chapters one through 14, the last 12 months, or at least the first 10 months of the 40th year in chapters 20 through 36. So then we have this this entire 37 and a half year period in the middle, and it's covered in just five chapters. Moses spends the least amount of time covering the longest period of time, and Moses picks out just a few episodes from this sad period of Israel's history. So with that, we'll begin our walkthrough of the book of Numbers, and let's begin in chapter 1, verse 1. Then Yahweh spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the tent of meeting on the first of the second month in the second year after they had come out of the land of Egypt, saying, Take a census of all the congregation of the sons of Israel by their families, by their fathers' households, according to the number of names, every male, head by head, From 20 years old and upward, whoever is able to go out to war in Israel, you and Aaron shall number them by their armies. God prepares Israel for the conquest of the promised land by numbering the fighting men. And the fighting men would total approximately 600,000 people. This doesn't include men or or, or women, or the men that were too old or too young to fight. So the total population was probably something like one and a half to two and a half million people. And there's been a lot written about um, logistical or archaeological or linguistic reasons why we can't trust those numbers. But there is no good reason not to take these numbers at face value. Um, actually, these the logistical challenges of moving such a group from Egypt to the promised land actually is what provides the necessity for God to supernaturally provide for them. And it's also what makes the Exodus miracle so identity-defining for Israel. So when we take the census numbers at face value, it shows the faithfulness of God. Faithfulness in multiplying his people from 70 at the end of Genesis, to somewhere in the range of two million. And in this census, the priests are exempted because they are responsible for the tabernacle and maintaining the Levitical system. They have a clergy exemption. They administer worship for the people, but don't fight the battles. And much of the instruction in this opening section relates to the priests and their work and how the tabernacle could be safely moved while still treating Yahweh as holy. In chapter 10, verse 11, and we're moving through this section very quickly, we read, Now it happened in the second year, in the second month on the 20th of the month, that the cloud was lifted from over the tabernacle of the testimony, and the sons of Israel set out on their journeys from the wilderness of Sinai. Chapter 10 ends with great anticipation of the success of the conquest and the fulfillment of the land promise. Look at verse 35 of chapter 10. Moses is shouting, rise up, O Yahweh, let your enemies be scattered. There's anticipation of success. And then abruptly, the excitement crashes. Beginning in chapter 11, we see consecutive episodes of Israel complaining, which provoked the Lord's judgment with Israel's 
rebellion in the wilderness, beginning in chapter 11. Let's look at verse 1 of chapter 11. Now, the people became like those who complain of calamity in the ears of Yahweh. And Yahweh heard it, and his anger was kindled, and the fire of Yahweh burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. The people start to complain about what we don't know, but God strikes the outskirts of the camp with fire. But this fire wasn't enough to alarm them, apparently, because in verse four, they complain again. And the rabble who were among them had greedy desires. And also the sons of Israel wept again and said, who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish which we used to eat in Egypt and the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic, but now our appetite is dried up. There is nothing at all to look at except this manna. They long for the variety of food they claim they previously had. Their complaint here is like their complaint in Exodus 16, where the whole congregation grumbled for pots of meat and bread. And Then God began sending them bread from heaven every morning, and he provided meat in the evening. And while the meat appeared to be temporary, the manna continued every single day for the last 12 months. And after 12 months of seeing this manna, the people complained, there is nothing at all to look at except this manna. Notice verse four says they had greedy desires They had more than they needed, but their desire for what they didn't have led to complaining. There was no gratitude for God's provision. They weren't starving, they had plenty of food, but their insistence on their own preferences led them to reject God's provision. We want variety, not the same daily bread. And grumbling is contagious. Moses hears the people complain, and then Moses complains. In verse 13, he asks God, where am I to get meat to give all this people? In verse 15, if you're going to deal thus with me, please kill me at once. Well, Yahweh responds to Moses' despair and complaint in verse 18. And say to the people, set yourselves apart as holy for tomorrow, and you shall eat meat. For you have wept in the ears of Yahweh, saying, Oh, that someone would give us meat to eat, for it was good for us in Egypt. Therefore, Yahweh will give you meat, and you shall eat. You shall eat not one day, not two days, not five days, not ten days, nor twenty days, but a whole month, until it comes out of your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you, because you have rejected Yahweh who is among you. Greedy desires among the people, not fulfilled, led to grumbling, and led to complaining. And what did they desire? Their, their stated desire was just for a bigger variety of food, maybe a buffet. And those are not bad desires. It's okay for us to desire things. It's okay to desire a new house. It's okay to desire my children to obey. It's okay to desire a promotion at work. Desires that contradict God's word are clearly evil, but in this, passage is, in this passage, Israel's desires are not necessarily wrong. So how does this result in God's view of this as sin? Well, this is exactly what we see play out in the book of James. James 1.14, and I'll just read it. 1.14 begins with desires but each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. And you can also read that as desire there. And then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully matured, it brings forth death. Something happens in our hearts when our desires turn into lusts. We typically call it something a lust when it is an inordinate desire or something that is controlling. A, a lust could be anything that if I don't get it, I will be discontent and happy, discontent and unhappy. Or maybe it causes me to complain, or that I'm willing to obey, disobey God in order to get it or to keep it. <laughs> 
Hey, lust has control over you, and lust is not just sexual desire. It can be any controlling desire. And while we're we're in James, James 4, 1 through 3 asks, What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is it not your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and you do not have. You don't get your way. So you commit murder. And now you may not commit murder, but you are envious. You crave something and you don't get it. So you grumble, complain, you fight, you quarrel. This is what we do. All sin relates to our desires, and desires can start out good, and they cross into lust when they become expectations or demands, and when those demands and expectations are more important than pleasing God, that is, we're willing to sin for them, it's idolatry. And in numbers, this plays out throughout the book. The Israelites have desires, and not always bad desires, but they are convinced that they're entitled to them, and when they don't get them, they're willing to sin to get them, and will reject Yahweh, Moses, or anyone else that is an obstacle to serving their desires. And that is why Numbers sometimes calls them greedy desires. They're self-focused, and desires unchecked, in the words of James, give birth to sin, and eventually death. And the Lord sees their grumbling in chapter 11, verse 20, as rejecting Yahweh. They rejected him, his plan, his provision, his wisdom. They wanted their own way, not God's way. And at the end of chapter 11, Yahweh brings, in response to their complaint, so many quail that you could walk in any direction outside the camp for a day and be inundated with them. In Exodus 16, if you will remember, quail came up and covered the camp in the evening. Here in Numbers, the wind brings them and drops them so that they fall, but outside the camp. In verse 32, he who gathered the least gathered at least 10 homers of quail, or picture 600 U.S. gallons. It's a lot of bird. And that was the person who had a bad day gathering. This is an abundant, supernatural provision of quail. You can almost hear Israel saying, if only we had some meat, we would be happy. And and then in response, it's as if God says, let there be meat. And there was a lot of it. And now as far as they can walk in the day, they are trudging through piles of birds. And this should, should have struck an Israelite as a little odd. He should have said, hey, remember the last time God sent us quail? The quail came into the camp. And this time the quail didn't come up into the camp. They came down outside of the camp. But why not inside the camp? Something is different here. He might have noticed similarities to a year earlier when frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. And when the frogs died, they were piled up in heaps. And while the frogs, like the quail, covered the land, what did the frogs not cover? The camp of Israel. These similarities between God's judgment of Egypt and the frogs and God sending the quails should have reminded them of God's promise in Exodus 15, which we looked at two weeks ago. And I'll read it for you, Exodus 15, 26. If you will earnestly listen to the voice of Yahweh your God and do what is right in his sight and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have put on the Egyptians. And that was both a promise and an implicit warning. If you don't obey, you will get plagues and diseases just like I sent on Egypt. And this warning will be repeated much more explicitly in Deuteronomy 28, 58 through 60, if you want to look up that later. Well, God's provision is still merciful. He provides in a way that should have served as a warning about the dangerous path that they were pursuing. If Pharaoh's rejection of Yahweh brought plagues, what would Israel's rejection bring? Let's continue in Numbers 11, down to verse 33. After the people had gathered and the greedy are are ready to dig in, while the meat was still between their teeth, this is verse 33, 
Before it was chewed, the anger of Yahweh was kindled against the people, and Yahweh struck the people with a very severe plague. The name of that place was called Kibroth Hatava, and because they were there, they buried the people who had been greedy. The greedy people who satisfied their own desires and thought nothing of sinning against Yahweh perished. And Psalm 78, we won't turn there, but it makes clear that Israel's problem here was unbelief. Not entrusting oneself to God's works, to his promises, to his ways. And that's what our discontentment, our jealousy, our grumbling, and our complaining reveal. We're not entrusting ourselves to the Lord. We want to be sovereign like God and order our own lives and we are, when we are discontent and grumbling, we are contending with God for sovereignty. We are contending for his throne. We want God's role for ourselves. We trust our plan, not his. We're worshiping ourselves. In chapter 12, Miriam and Aaron complain against Moses. In chapters 13 and 14, we get to the greatest rebellion yet. Israel is looking out on the southern edge of the promised land and sends 12 spies into the land to investigate. And you know the story, after 40 days, these spies see the land is exactly as the Lord had promised. Look at 1327. Thus, they recounted to him and said, we went into the land where you sent us, and certainly, it certainly does flow with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Right? That's what God had promised, a land flowing milk, with milk and honey, and this is exactly what the spies saw. Yahweh has given us everything he promised, but, but there, there are some problems. The report continues in verse 28. Nevertheless, the people who live in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large, and moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there, giants, and Amalek is living in the land of the Negev, Negev, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites are living in the hill country, and the Canaanites are living by the sea and by the side of the Jordan. And from here on out, everything is fueled by unbelief. Nothing will be as easy as it thought, and face with the choice between trusting the Lord or trusting their own wisdom, the spies convince them to disobey God's command. But Caleb, one of the spies, in verse 30, appeals to them. And then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, we should by all means go up and take possession of it, for we are surely able to overcome it. Caleb had courage and he knew God's promise and he trusted that God could and would keep it. But like they rejected Yahweh, they rejected Caleb. Verse 32, so they gave out to the sons of Israel a bad report of the land. The land which we have passed through to spy out on is a land that devours its inhabitants. Caleb challenged the unbelief of the spies and they suddenly adjust their story. They, as they give their report to the, of the land to the people, they seemingly now omit the truth about the abundant provision from their earlier report. Only passing along the details that their fearful, disobedient hearts feel are relevant to getting their way. And don't we do that? When we want our way and there's a disagreement or maybe we're trying to win people over to our viewpoint, how tempting is it to Maybe ignore the good points on the other side. Or maybe on our side, we leave out key facts. We can be just like Israel. So quick to misrepresent the facts, obscure the details, adjust the story just a little so that we can get our own way. To get our greedy desires and reject God in the process. In chapter 14, the people want to elect a new leader to bring them back to Egypt they don't, they don't believe God can give them the land. Their own bitterness and discontentment and unbelief have clouded their judgment and their reason, right? They haven't even considered what going back to Egypt would be like. What would Egypt do to them if they showed up there without Moses? But sin deceives, 
And often when we are bitter and we complain and we pursue our own desires, how easy is it to turn a blind eye to what is true, to what is real? And Joshua and Caleb make one final attempt to persuade the people, and but the people prepare to stone them. But Yahweh appears and saves Joshua and Caleb and says in chapter 14, verse 10, 14, 10, how long will this people spurn me and how long will they not believe in me despite all the signs which I have done in their midst? God threatens to destroy the nation and start over with Moses, but Moses intercedes and Yahweh pardons Israel as a nation. Again, he will maintain his promises to them. But the current generation, they'll perish. Look at verse 22 of chapter 14. Surely all the men who have seen my glory and my signs, which I have done in Egypt and in the wilderness, yet have put me to the test these 10 times and have not listened to my voice, shall by no means see the land which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who spurned me see it. The first generation, fails to trust and obey Yahweh. And what should have been an 11-day journey from Sinai to the border of the Promised Land would instead become a 38-year wandering funeral procession as an entire generation dies off before the second generation can enter the land. But will the second generation do any better? Remember, Moses is writing to the second generation, and that generation needed to trust the Lord. Moses provides these details as a warning to them. Don't do what your parents did and forfeit God's blessing. Well, at the end of chapter 14, the people vow to follow Moses, but feeling the sting of the loss of the promised land, which they didn't want just the day ago, Their greedy desires kick in when they're told they can no longer enter the land. They lust and they do not have, always craving, never satisfied, so they disobey God's command and rush into battle to seize what no longer belongs to them. And they are defeated. And for many in Israel that day, lust conceived, it gave birth to sin, and it brought forth death. In chapter 15, more instructions are given for when they do enter Canaan, and God continues to teach the people the importance of obedience, and by instructing them to stone the man who rebelliously broke God's Sabbath command. His desire to gather wood was more important than honoring Yahweh, and it resulted in his death. Israel needed to learn this lesson. We need to learn this lesson Do we fully entrust ourselves and submit ourselves to God's word to fully obey it? Well, chapter 16, there's more rebellion. We see Korah's rebellion, more greedy desires. Levites from outside of Aaron's priestly line wanted the priesthood for themselves. They were were jealous of Aaron. They didn't like their job given by God. They wanted Aaron's job and they found sympathetic ears and got others to join their rebellion in the sons of Reuben who weren't even Levites. Fast forward to the end of that incident. Chapter 16, verse 31. And it happened that as he finished speaking all these words, the ground that was under them split open and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up and their households, and all the men who belonged to Korah with their possessions. In a bit of irony, the spies had said that the land of Canaan devours its inhabitants. Well, here the wilderness actually devours Korah and his household. And then fire also came out and devoured the 250 men who directly challenged Aaron for the priesthood. And then 10 verses later, 1641, more grumbling, more complaining, and the people actually blame Moses and Aaron for the death of Korah and Dathan and Abiram. And Yahweh, again, punishes those who reject him, and nearly 15,000 more corpses fall in the wilderness. Verses 
Chapter 17, God puts his stamp of approval on the priestly line of Aaron by causing his rod to supernaturally sprout almonds as a sign of his choosing of them. And in chapter 18, with the question of the priesthood hopefully settled, instructions are given about how the priests are to be sustained by the meat from the sacrifices. Now it's, next, it's helpful to remember that over a million people would have likely perished in the wilderness. It's probably something just shy of 100 deaths per day. Think about how many corpses and dead bodies the Israelites would encounter from which they needed to be cleansed. So in chapter 19, we find instructions and procedures for ritual cleansing if an Israelite comes in contact with a dead body. And in chapter 20, we enter the 40th year. Miriam dies and the people grumble for lack of water. Rather, they contend with God. That's what Meribah means, the the name of the location where they will contend. But this isn't just about thirst, but their lack of trust in God's provision and God's timing. They wanted what they wanted, when they wanted it, and they still don't believe his word that Yahweh will bring them to the promised land. But God has compassion and commands Moses to speak to the rock to bring them water. And Moses, clearly impatient, strikes the rock rock instead in his anger, and so even Moses, for not treating the Lord as holy and carefully obeying his command, is told that he too will not enter the promised land. Later in chapter 20, we see the high priesthood pass from Aaron to Eliezer, and Aaron dies. Now look down at chapter 21. The Canaanite king of Arad comes and attacks, and Israel destroys their city. And then look at verse 4. Then they set out from Mount Hor by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the people became impatient on the way. And so they complain, and look at verse five. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this miserable food. Let's read that last part again. There is no food and no water, that sounds horrible. But what's the next word out of their mouth? We loathe this miserable food. Oh, so there is food, you say. Have you ever heard this complaint in your house? There's nothing to eat in the house. But what they mean is there is nothing that I want to eat in the house. This is Israel. There is abundant provision, but their preferences aren't being satisfied. And notice their complaining spirit, again, breeds subtle dishonesty, even in the language of their complaint. So God then sends another plague on Israel in the form of snakes that come upon them during their travel. The snakes bite, the people die. And then an interesting command of Yahweh's comes in chapter 21, verse eight. Then Yahweh said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a standard and it will be that everyone who is bitten and looks at it will live. If you ever thought, what is the connection between healing and looking at a snake pole? Israel had a faith issue. They they didn't believe. They refused to trust God at his word, and God was teaching them to trust his wisdom. It is totally illogical to think that looking at a bronze snake could heal anyone, but that's what Yahweh instructed. Consider the size of the camp of Israel. It would have occupied several square miles to house two million people. In camp, Moses would have been at the center of the camp. Um, But as the complaining here seems to have occurred while they were going around the land of Edom, Moses would have been at the very front of this long procession. So in either case, whether they're in camp or on the road, it's reasonable to think that looking at the pole required miles of travel while suffering snake bite symptoms like swelling, blistering, bleeding, pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, labored breathing, 
racing heart, blurred vision, sweating, numbness, or muscle twitching. This wasn't a comfortable jaunt to go find the pole. This was a bad snake bite that was going to kill you if you didn't go find Moses and look at the pole as Yahweh instructed. And this demanded a willingness to renounce your own wisdom and trust him by enduring a long, painful walk, recognizing that it might be the very last thing you do, entrusting yourself to God's wisdom and casting yourself fully on God's remedy for your sickness. Before this section ends, we also see a couple of victories against surrounding nations who come out to attack Israel. And then we move to chapter 22. The next section on our outline, rebellion on the plains of Moab. We've been following Israel's rebellion in the wilderness, and now they've arrived to Moab. The first generation, some of them still remain, and that rebellion continues. Read chapter 22, verse 1. Then the sons of Israel set out and camped in the plains of Moab beyond the Jordan opposite Jericho. So they are just east of Jericho, essentially overlooking the promised land. And in chapters 22 to 24, Balak, the king of Moab, who was threatened by Israel's size, similar to Pharaoh in Exodus, allies with the Midianites. Well, Moab, Moab and Midian hire the non-Israelite Balaam to curse Israel. But God surprisingly appears to the false prophet Balaam and warns him not to go. And Balaam was smart enough not to directly defy Yahweh. But eventually God tells him, rise up and go with them. But only speak what I tell you. But in 22.22 we read, God was angry because he was going. Why was God angry? He told him to go. Well, because God also knew what was in Balaam's heart. 2 Peter 2.15 says, Balaam loved the wages of unrighteousness. Balaam may have been afraid to cross Yahweh, but he was ultimately motivated by his love of wealth. In God's sovereignty, Balaam is unable to curse Israel, but instead blesses Israel, and God gives Balaam several prophecies that Yahweh uses to affirm his promises to Abraham. One of them we'll look at in Numbers 24, 17. Balaam even reiterates Jacob's prophecy from Genesis 49 of an end-time, scepter-wielding descendant of Jacob that will rule the nations. A a pagan prophet unknowingly speaks of the future earthly reign of Christ. Yes, even Numbers contains eschatology. Well, as this section draws to a close in chapter 25, the men of Israel play the harlot with the daughters of Moab. The women have enticed Israel through sexual immorality and Israel bows down and sacrifices to the regional deity, Baal of Peor. And God commands Israel to kill the men who worship Baal and another 24,000 Israelite corpses drop. How did, how did such blatant idolatry and sexual immorality get a foothold in Israel? Well, in thir- chapter 31, don't turn there, we learn that uh, Balaam, after he was unsuccessful in cursing Israel, he counseled Moab and Midian to seduce the people by immorality and idolatry. Balaam wanted to get paid after all, and it worked. And it sadly didn't take too much time or effort to seduce Israel. Why? Israel had already been fanning the flames of idolatry in their hearts by cultivating greedy desires, which quickly spread to every form of lustful passion. And in this incident, Israel utterly disregarded at least six of the Ten Commandments. Grumbling, complaining, contending with God for sovereignty. This is a rejection of God. And it will quickly lead you down a path where you never thought you'd be. By the end of this section, we see the real obstacle 
to the Israelites, entering the promised land is not giants and fortified cities, but unbelief. The last judgment is recorded as a warning for the second generation who still must learn to trust Yahweh as they enter the land and fight the inhabitants. And after the death of the 24,000 in chapter 25, it seems that all that remains of the first generation is Joshua, Caleb, and Moses. And so we move into the second section of the book, which is, we'll go through much quicker. The second generation, the first generation has passed, and in the opening chapters, we see the preparation for the promised land at Moab. And the most significant event we see here is the second census. In chapter 26, verse 64, I'll give you a second to turn there, chapter 26, verse 64, But among these there was not a man of those who were numbered by Moses and Aaron the priest, who numbered the sons of Israel in the wilderness of Sinai. Not a single one remained. The point here is that the punishment on the first generation is over, and the movement toward the land can resume. And so the rest of this section deals with preparations for entering that land. In the second census, we see the population of the army is about the same as it was 39 years earlier, around 600,000 fighting men. Israel's disobedience paused God's continued multiplication of his people. And this is a good reminder that each generation's experiences of the blessing of the Abrahamic covenant is connected to that generation's obedience. The, generation, the, the promises of God are not nullified, but that generation's experience is connected to their obedience. And so this generation experienced no additional multiplication. Chapter 27 will deal with the issues of inheritance in the land for those without sons, and Moses will appoint Joshua as his successor. Chapter 28 and 29 renew the instructions to the second generation about regular offerings for each time of celebration and add some additional offerings for when they're in the land. Chapter 30 has some important instructions for men's leadership in the household as a protection for wives and daughters. And in chapter 31, the sin of the Midianite seduction of Israel must be dealt with. And every male of Midian is killed at God's command. Chapter 32, the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh settle their families east of the Jordan River, taking their inheritance there instead of in the land. And in chapter 33, Moses closes off this section by recounting the entire history of Israel's travels from Egypt to Moab. And this will lead to the final section of the book, instructions for the land taken in conquest. This final section will provide instructions for the land. And in those chapters, we'll see Israel is charged to take possession of the land and live in it because God has given it. Israel is instructed about what to do with the inhabitants of the land. Israel is commanded to destroy all the molten images and destroy all the high places in the land to prevent further idolatry, which would have future devastating consequences when not obeyed. Israel is also instructed for how to divide up the land and given a prohibition on land transferring from one tribe to another through intermarriage. The inheritance was to be perpetual within a tribe. And that brings us to the end of Numbers. And looking ahead, while Moses has very little time left, he still has much to say in his final months to the second generation before they cross the Jordan. Moses' farewell sermons on the plains of Moab are found in the book of Deuteronomy, which Scott Maxwell will walk us through next week. But I want to think now about some application. How should this book of Numbers affect us? And at the risk of smuggling multiple sermons into the closing section, I want to allow the writers of the New Testament to guide us in some application as we look to see how they reflected on numbers in some very familiar passages. The first one is, as by way of application, is to put off greedy desires. Put off evil cravings, idolatry, grumbling, complaining, immorality, immorality, 
contending with or trying the Lord. You can't turn to 1 Corinthians 10. Verse 1. Now, these things happened as examples for us so that we would not crave evil things as they also craved. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play. Nor let us act immorally as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in one day. Nor let us try the Lord as some of them did and were destroyed by the serpents. Nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now, these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man, and God is faithful, who will now allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 is just, it offers such hope. Doesn't this context help put some legs on that passage? When we're tempted to grumble, to complain, to serve ourselves or our idols, there's a way of escape every time. God is faithful God can be trusted to keep his word like he did to Israel. Secondly, come to Jesus, the true bread from heaven. Uh, We we won't read this passage, so you can just listen, but write down John 6, 31 through 35. In this passage, we know that God provided for Israel bread from heaven, and they rejected his provision. Here, Christ, contrasting himself with the manna from heaven, says, I am the true bread from heaven. And he says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. God has satisfied our deepest need in Christ, and we must not reject this bread. Thirdly, watch out for the deceitfulness of sin and unbelief. Open up to Hebrews 3. Verse 12. See to it, brothers, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God, but encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. While it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. For who provoked him when they had heard? Indeed, not all of those who came out of Egypt led by Moses. And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. If you're hearing these words, it is still today. It's not too late for you. Believe in Christ. Believer, be on the alert. Be on the alert for the deceitfulness of sin in your own life and for the ever-present danger of hardness of heart, be on short accounts with God. You know, sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. Grumbling, complaining, jealousy, impatience in your life, flowing out of inordinate desires, evidences unbelief in the heart. Places where you are not trusting, yielding, and submitting to God. Cast yourself fully upon him and his wisdom and confess and repent. And lastly, look to Christ alone as God's remedy for sin. Turn to John 3, 14 through 16. I'm surprised most people that Numbers provides the background to John 3, 16. 
Verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Just as the Israelites in the wilderness, dying of a fatal wound, needed to look up in face, look up in faith, confessing their inability to to save themselves and cast themselves on God's wisdom and remedy, we too have a fatal wound that no human wisdom can heal. There's nothing that we can do to save ourselves, to close the gap between us and God because of our sin. We must confess our inability and cast ourselves on God's wisdom and provision for our sin. Jesus Christ, who came in flesh, bore our sin and was lifted up on a cross to bear the punishment of our sin as our sinless substitute. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that you have given us these things that were written earlier for our instruction that through the perseverance and encouragement of the scriptures, we might find hope. Lord, I pray as that we would heed the warnings of numbers, that we would be quick to turn from our sin and turn to your son. Lord, that we would not be content with unchecked sin in our heart and Our desires that have gotten out of hand and are beginning to compete with our love and affection for you. Lord, help us to see those things in your word and that we'd be quick to repent of them. Or that we would be quick to listen to others as they point them out in in us. Lord, we thank you that we have a cure, a remedy in your son. In your name we pray, amen.